Is China pursuing debt trap diplomacy in Africa? China doesn't see Africa as a continent of people. It sees only a twin conquest. One, to enrich their economy with Africa's resources. And two, a piece of land to compete and beat America. It's a cold-blooded way of looking at things, but that's what China is doing. Their loans are sinking African nations. As you heard in the clip, this has been the predominant framing of the situation around China's form of economic engagement in Africa. My name is Mika, and I'm joined by my co-host, Amadeus Musumali, and this is what we'll be discussing in the episode of The Crane, an Africa-China podcast. So, we've launched, and I have to say, uh, despite uh, what it looks like in our visual imagery, me and Amadeus did not plan on both having our heads resting on our chins, but it seems to me that we kind of had a subconscious coordination on that. So... Today, we wanted to discuss the so-called debt trap diplomacy that China is pursuing in Africa. We must keep in mind that debt has been hanging over the African continent like a wake of vultures. And most African countries have interest bills that are much higher than their national revenues. And added to this, budgets are generally managed through austerity and driven by deep cuts in government employment, as well as in essential services such as education and the healthcare sectors. Just under two-thirds of the debt owed by most African countries is dominated in foreign currencies, which makes debt repayment nearly impossible without further borrowing, and that often results in a cycle of indebtedness with no permanent relief in sight. I mean, I think most African countries have, I think, 50% of their revenues go towards paying to service their debts, right? So Amadeus, this is a big and very complex subject, but we're hoping to start opening up the topic um, in relation to debt trap diplomacy as it relates to China, Africa. And so today we'll be covering three areas. I want to, one, briefly mention some of the international implications. Two, we're going to break down what debt trap diplomacy is all about and how it can be cast in relation to Africa. And we also want to thirdly discuss who really owns Africa's external debt. So many uh, might have seen in the news, uh, over a month ago in Sri Lanka, we saw protesters storming the presidential palace and ousting the then president, Raja Pakse. And in res- this was basically a response to the crippling economic crisis where debt has played a huge role. And I wanted to raise this because Sri Lanka has been one of the prime um, countries that many Western governments and Western media houses have accused China of playing the role of debt trap diplomacy. But when we look at some of the official data given by the Sri Lankan government, it actually indicates that only 10% of Sri Lanka's external debt is actually owed to Chinese entities, whereas 47% is held by Western banks and investment companies. You know, Amadeus was talking about uh, JP Morgan and Chase from the US. We're talking about HSBC from Britain, UBS from Switzerland. Ah, the usual suspects. The usual suspects. And despite these facts, the IMF, USAID constantly say that the renegotiation of Sri Lanka's debt with China is actually the issue. And I mean, if you remember uh, some years ago, there was this big allegations about debt trap diplomacy around the Hambantota Tota port, which has been widely um, investigated and debunked, namely by Deborah Bautigem at CARI, the China Africa Research Institute and John Hopkins. So, you know, for that reason, we thought it's important for us to delve into the topic of debt trap diplomacy. As well as in your own country, Zambia, we saw recently uh, in the news headlines that China and other state creditors have decided to negotiate a little bit of debt relief on this huge, this country that produces huge amounts of copper, um, but yet is unable to get out of a crisis of debt that they've inherited from colonial times, as well as in the kind of neoliberal era from the 70s and 80s. So debt trap diplomacy is a subject that I think we do need to discuss and is quite timely in this moment. But I think we should start with what is the so-called debt trap diplomacy? Yes, debt trap diplomacy involves extending unsustainable loans to poor developing countries and potentially taking control of key assets if the debtor defaults on repayment, Um, or potentially using the default on that debt in order to further political and economic leverage. So what that means is that the allegation is that some countries or groups of countries um, extend loans to the developing world, the global south, that they know 
cannot be repaid when the uh, debtor fails to pay back this debt. Um, the allegation is that then that leaves them open to the seizure of key strategic national assets or to political pressure to implement um, economic or uh, political policies that may not be to the advantage of the debtor, but um, to the person whom they or the group, the country, they own the debt to. So China, we are told, um, somehow, you know, bedazzles poor countries and seduces them into taking unsustainable loans, you know, loan after loan to build expensive, you know, white elephant infrastructure projects that they can't afford, that will never yield any benefits, or so the story goes, and that this will all somehow end with Beijing taking control of the assets of all these struggling borrowers in the global south. And I mean, this isn't... It's interesting because in these conversations, uh, especially that are given through different media reports or through different Western political actors um, and economic actors, we seldom are getting the voices of Africans. So we just want to play you this clip of the president of the African Development Bank, Akinwumi Adesina, and let's hear what he has to say. The interest and engagement of China and Africa is welcome. And it serves African countries in terms of meeting their infrastructure needs. Well, will I say there were no mistakes made in the beginning? No, I wouldn't say so. Uh, there are issues of sensitivity to local communities. Uh, there are issues of making sure you don't displace uh, 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 people in the labor market. Um, but these are uh, things, a learning experience, a learning curve uh, for China as it's engaged in Africa. But when you look at what uh, it is, I don't think that is a deliberate uh, uh, planned by China to indebt any country uh, at all. Um, I think China is fulfilling a very important role, which is in terms of, you know, infrastructure support. And for us, where infrastructure is still a, a challenge in terms of financing infrastructure, the continent still has a challenge. The issue of quality infrastructure is very important, and that is at the heart of our engagement with the government of Japan. Well, I don't see a competition. Uh, at all. I, I see complementarity. You know, Africa has tremendous amount of needs. Africa has, you know, uh, you know friends. Uh, Africa is a friend of China. Africa is a friend of Japan. So this is the opinion of many African leaders, African policymakers, but it seldom comes in those kind of mainstream media reporting around debt and credit between China and or Chinese institutes and Chinese state actors and the African continent. But it's also backed up by really solid uh, studies that are coming out of well-established universities and research groups, such as you came across a Columbia Oxford study debunking this, right? Yes, this is very, very interesting um, because you don't really expect this from elite universities in the global north. But um, there's a very, very fascinating study that came out a few months ago called uh, Politics by Default, China and the Global Governance of African Debt. And this is a joint study. Uh, brought out uh, between uh, Columbia University and the University of Oxford in uh, the UK. And um, it basically says that the whole debt trap narrative in Africa is a function of Chinese and US strategic and ideological rivalry rather than a reflection of African realities and perspectives. So that's already very provocative, very interesting. So the study goes on to say that, yes, China is Africa's biggest bilateral creditor. Bilateral, I want to emphasize that. But most of Africa's total public debt is held by private Western creditors. When you look at the total debt of African governments, only 8% or 78 billion US dollars of sub-Saharan Africa's total public debt is owned by Chinese entities. So that's 8%. This is 8% out of a total public debt in sub-Saharan Africa of 945 billion US dollars. So it's really a drop in the bucket. But we can we can dig a little bit deeper and look a little bit deeper into this. And the study actually goes on to say that um, actually um, half of Africa's public debt is domestically issued. Uh, which means that domestic investors, financial um, institutions, etc., take up that government debt, which is completely normal. Governments want to raise debt at home in their local financial industry. That is 
bog standard, nothing special there. Now, what's interesting is that the other half of that public debt in sub-Saharan Africa is owned by external actors. And the total figure of that debt is uh, 427 billion US dollars. So 427 billion US dollars um, of Africa's um, public debt is owned by external actors. So these are institutions, investors, groups that are not from the continent or not from the countries in question. Now, of that particular debt, China only accounts for 18%, while a third of that debt is owned to other bilateral official partners. So these are this is government-to-government kind of lending. And a third of this is owned by international financial institutions. Okay, very interesting. And the last third of this is in euro bonds. Again, something very, very interesting. So the vast majority of Africa's external debt is not owned by China. It's owned by government and predominantly by private investors from the Western world or the global north. So these are people, you know, from London, Frankfurt, and New York who are buying up African debt. According to uh, the report's uh, authors, the segment has been growing very, very fast over the last couple of years. And it's also been um, the fastest growing liability on the balance sheet of African states when it comes to external debt. So the private sector, the private Western lending is the fastest growing um, component of African external debt. Now, Boston and John Hopkins universities from the United States estimate that Beijing has lent about 150 billion US dollars to African countries since uh, the year 2000, mostly via uh, China Exim Bank, who did 60% of this lending, and China Development Bank, which uh, carried out 25% of this lending. Research by Boston and John Hopkins Universities indicates that 75 billion out of that 150 billion uh, US dollars in debt has already been paid off. When the study looks at the issue of African uh, public debt, that is uh, public debt that is owned to external debtors or debt holders, we also have to acknowledge that Chinese debt is heavily concentrated in five countries on the continent. So five countries on the African continent hold the majority of uh, Chinese debt. And these countries are Angola, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, and my own home country, Zambia. Now, this makes this narrative that Chinese debt is somehow jeopardizing the entire continent an exaggeration at best, like at best, really. Now, the authors of the study conclude that if Africa is plunged into a wave of government default, it will be because of private Western financial interest rather than, and I quote, alleged Chinese scheming. Which again, this is in 2022, we're getting this kind of reporting. And if I could just add, um, if we look at those five countries, I think Angola is the one that holds also disproportionately so the highest percentage of Chinese lending. So it's important to see that it's not homogenous. It's not across the whole continent. It varies in different contexts. And hopefully in future episodes, we can delve into these countries to look at a little bit of the specificities around why that's the case. Because, for example, Angola has in the last two decades experienced huge amounts of capital flight. And one of their former presidents uh, was leaked, and I think it was in the Panama Papers, one of these paper leaks. Uh, I think they were called that, Luanda, Luanda leaks or something like oh, that. Oh, yes, the Luanda leaks, perhaps it is, where it was found that the one of the former presidents had massive amounts of capital investment that were all in offshore you know, tax havens. So she was not paying taxes on, I think it's over 50 different business companies or business entities. And so you have to read into the context, right? We have to understand the context. And uh, I'm hoping that we can get into that in, in future. But another aspect, I did want to highlight the, that I said many studies We were giving you the most recent one that came out a couple of months ago in 2022. But Chatham House in 2020 also gave a study that refuted and debunked the kind of myth of Chinese debt trap diplomacy on our continent. And part of it, the reasons that they give why it's not necessarily the case is, one, it's also been discussed that the BRI project, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is basically, you know, 
different countries signing memorandums of understanding around certain trade and infrastructure and construction projects with the Chinese government. But what they say is that the BRI is a form of, you know, China expanding its colonialism and they'll use the word colonialism in certain contexts. But if you look at it, one, BRI is primarily an economic project. Two, China's development financing is a bit too fragmented and it's not centrally coordinated because these are private businesses who sign on from the Chinese side. And so, you know, it, it would be a bit too, it's, it is too challenging for them to coordinate and to pursue a detailed, you know, strategic objective, uh, notwithstanding, as they put it, leaders and central agencies' efforts at loosely guiding the BRI's board direction. And then thirdly, that Chinese development financing is heavily recipient driven. So it also is based on those who sign on from the African side and they can't necessarily, uh, they don't get to pick and choose necessarily. It is kind of an open call and different African countries and African uh, companies are the ones who then decide to be part of this. But as they say in the report, and I think we can agree, Amadeus, it's not to say that there are negative economic, political, social, even environmental implications. And as we saw from the president or heard from the president of the African Development Bank, mistakes have been made. Uh, there have been uneven political positions and economic positionings that allow for certain people to lobby for their interests a bit better, whilst others aren't as, as able to do so. And so what we need to think, I think, going forward is how are African countries particularly through FOCAC, the China, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, that have basically signed on almost all African countries into a form of cooperation around trade, education, different forms of exchange between China and different African countries. So I think it is really up to our African governments and our African policymakers to be trying to pursue a more collective approach uh, to how we deal with China and how we negotiate and basically procure these kind of loans, loan agreements. But the big question then or that we have already touched on a little bit, but I think we should give a bit more details around it, is who actually owns Africa's external debt? Yes, Mika, 100%. I just want to emphasize the point you made about African agency. This is what is missing from this entire discussion. As we heard from the um, clip we monitored in the intro to this podcast, now, the entire discussion around this idea of a debt trap takes away African agency. And the fact that our uh, leaders, our institutions have the ability to negotiate they have the ability to um, engage on the terms, the conditionality of this debt, and they have a choice who they lend from. So I think it's very, very disturbing that the general narrative of the so-called debt trap in Africa always denies the idea of African agency and ability to, you know, um, influence uh, what kind of debt we get and what the terms and conditions of this are. But in terms of who actually um, owns um, Africa's external debt, let's dig a little bit deeper. So, um, by the way, all the sources uh, that we reference in the show will be in the show notes in the description below. So you can check this out yourself. So, we are going to reference another study that came out this year in 2022. This is a report by an NGO from the UK called uh, the Debt Justice. Um, and Debt Justice uh, came up with a very interesting report that uh, found that um, African governments own three times more debt to private Western lenders than China. And African governments are charged double the interest rate by these private Western lenders. This is all according to data or new calculations that uh, were made based on World Bank data by uh, the UK's Debt Justice uh, NGO. So this has huge implication, not just for <laughs> you know public awareness and transparency, but also how uh, debt relief is managed. So according to this report, and if I could just uh -huh. jump in, also jump to in. add that you say you know double the interest rates, and often the with the Chinese loans, they often have longer repayment periods as well. So I just wanted to throw that in. And the Chinese lenders are more flexible about renegotiating repayment periods unlike Western lenders who are willing to do this, but it comes at a cost. Conditions. 
Terms and conditions apply, right? Let's not forget the T's and C's uh, are a little bit more rigid in the case of Western lenders versus Chinese lenders who generally don't put any kind of conditionalities on what kind of economic policies a country should be pursuing. As we saw in the 1980s uh, with the case of Western lenders basically forcing <laughs> the hand of African governments to privatize key national resources to cut on social spending in order to service those debts. And when we look at the interest rates that are charged, this is shocking. I mean, this is <laughs> outrageous. So what Debt Justice found was that private Western lenders charged the highest interest rates to African governments, averaging generally around 5% in 2021. Now compare this to a 2.7% interest range charged on average by Chinese lenders. I mean, this is a, a shocking difference when you look at it. Now, what is expected according to the report is that over the next seven years, 35% of African governments' total external debt servicing will go to Western private lenders, and only 19% will go to Chinese lenders. So the future revenue that African countries should use to develop their economies, build up industry, look out for the needs of the people, is going to go into massive debt servicing of private Western debt. Uh, that is shocking and is utterly unacceptable. Um, now, again, we have to be nuanced here. Uh, the debt composition differs across the continent. So South Sudan, for example, owes 81%, 81% of its debt repayment to private Western creditors and just 11 to China. On the other hand, the study's calculations show that Angola, which we talked about earlier, owes 59% of its external debt to China. Now, we were talking about the issue of debt relief and the implications of all of this on debt relief for Africa. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Zambia became one of the first countries in Africa in 2020 during COVID to um, officially default on its uh, debt obligations and to seek relief. Now, China took part in the G20's Debt Service Suspension Initiative, which was an initiative that was uh, started during COVID to kind of help countries that were struggling due to the economic ravages of this uh, awful pandemic uh, to repay their debt. Um, private Western lenders did not participate in this. And as we've learned during this podcast, they hold the largest chunk of Africa's debt. They didn't take part in this debt suspension. Now, the scheme itself could only suspend 23% of external debt payments because private and other multilateral lenders were not included. The situation is so severe that the IMF, the IMF Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, has called on the United Kingdom, that's Britain, and the US to pass legislation to stop private lenders from blocking debt relief agreements. So private lenders are actually able to legally stop debt relief schemes and agreements if they feel these go against their personal interests. This is shocking. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that these private Western lenders are being shielded by Western governments. And that is especially true for the UK and the US. And they keep using China as a destruction for the inconvenient truth that the real obstacle here is private financial capital from the Western world, not China. And this is even without getting into the bigger, more structural issues. I mean, we could talk about colonialism, capitalism, and how we live in an ugly reality of a world that's dominated by economic interests of different international financial institutions. So even ignoring those kind of bigger picture things, it's plain to see that the debt trap narrative around China-Africa has been obscuring the reality of things, which we've seen how some Western governments and media continue to perpetuate this and this has already been disproven. This It is a disproven narrative, and it should be a disproven narrative, but it continues. But I just want to touch as we're kind of wrapping up that it has disallowed us to see the bigger picture. And, you know, earlier you were talking about the lack of centralizing African agency in these conversations. But the flip side of that is the fact that 
we do have limited agency because we live in a world where we've inherited many of the inequalities and power dynamics of colonialism. And we currently live in a world, we call it capitalism. Some people want to call it globalization or modern economics, but capitalism that thrives off of sustaining um, unequal and... Exploitative. (laughs) And exploitative relationships between the global north and the global south, the historical colonizers and the historically colonized. So the bigger picture begs the question, when we are even discussing debt trap diplomacy, is why do we even live in a world where a country that has the richest copper mines like Zambia is so crippled by so much debt? What kind of global financial system breeds these kinds of crises? And for us, uh, those of us who are anti-imperialists or anti-capitalists, that is the big picture we always want to keep in mind when we do have these conversations. But there are also immediate solutions that have been proposed. I mean, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the Jubilee Debt Campaign. I think it started in 2000 or, or so. And they've been coming up with many different ways that we could, like common sense measures that could remove this kind of uh, debt uh, hangover that we have, not only in the African continent, but across the global south, we'd say. So in October 2020, they basically made the following proposals. One is that the IMF owns significant quantities of gold, amounting to 90.5 million ounces, which, I mean, I don't know how much that is exactly, uh, but is worth around $168 billion. Wow. If they <laughs> sold if they sold just 6.7% of their gold, they could raise more than enough money to pay um, the $8.2 billion that initially had made up the DSSI country's debt. So you mentioned the DSSI, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative. Initiative yes. So they could have, by selling that gold, could have, and that's just, you know, just skin off their nose, they could have addressed that situation. They're not in the business of that. (laughs) Not in their interest. (laughs) The The campaign also suggested that rich countries could draw billions of dollars towards this cancellation by issuing less than 9% of their IMF special drawing rights allocation. So again, the money is there. They just aren't interested, as you say. And other ways to reduce debt burden also includes cancelling debt repayments to the World Bank and the IMF, who are supposedly two multilateral institutions with a mandate to ensure the advancement of social development, not their own, you know, financial interests. But the World Bank has not moved on this agenda, despite, you know, like the IMF managing director that you mentioned, despite people like them making, you know, certain public uh, outcries about the situation. And so we find ourselves in the situation where we continue to be in a massive debt crisis on the continent. In the long term, as I was saying, in the long term, there are bigger things we need to confront. And I wanted to use this quote from Thomas Sankara, who in 1987 was speaking out against debt and its neo-colonial and its imperial uh, implications or its imperial logic. And he says, under its current form, controlled and dominated by imperialism, Debt is a skillfully managed reconquest of Africa, intended to subjugate its growth and development through foreign rules. And he says even more dramatically, but accurately, each one of us becomes the financial slave, which is to say a true slave, of those who had been treacherous enough to put money in our countries with obligations for us to repay. That is so important, Mika, because debt affects real people. This isn't just some theoretical financial talk. Being in debt means there's no medicine in your hospitals. It means that um, kids can't go to school uh, because there's not enough teachers. There are no books. There are no facilities. It means that you can't build vital roads that people need to get to work, to school, to hospital, and also to take part in economic life. So debt has a real impact on Africa. Debt kills. People are dying because of these debts. We hope you enjoyed our conversation and we're looking forward to getting into this topic in future episodes, perhaps, as I said, focusing on specific countries, as well as having guests join us. You've been listening to The Crane, an Africa-China podcast brought to you by the Dongsheng Collective. Visit dongshengnews.org where you can subscribe to our Media Digest 
and our Chinese Voices series. Or find us on social media. Please, if you enjoyed The Crane, rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps the algorithm and it helps other people find us. Thank you. Tune in next time. And don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe. Bye-bye. <laughs>